Hi, I'm Alan Hedblum. Welcome to our show, a place to feel like you belong. Today, it's our pleasure to have in the studio Attila Morsolgo. Attila is a husband, a father of two, and a ballet dancer who only recently hung up his shoes. He now works as a ballet master and junior company artistic director for the Grand Rapids Ballet. Attila, welcome to Feel Like You Belong. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So your family's journey to the United States actually started with your grandparents in 1956. Tell us about that. That's correct. Uh, my grandparents uh, immigrated uh, in 56 and uh, left behind uh, my father and uh, his brothers in Hungary. So uh, after growing up, um, you know, they decided to uh, perhaps it was time to visit the grandparents and of course this is many years later. So, so talk about what's the motive for our viewers who uh, aren't hi uh, historical buffs? What, what's the reason people left Hungary in 56? The uh, reason for it was, I think everybody had their personal reasons, but the idea of being able to start a life where you could make your own choices and have your own visions recognized and uh, make a life for yourself that you envisioned for yourself, I think that was the main motivator for a lot of people. So people literally just you know, picked up a suitcase, packed it up with whatever they thought was necessary, and they left. Start a new life, new place? Yep. New place, new, new life, new place, new faces, new friends, new everything. So your grandparents were living in the U.S., had become citizens, mm -hmm. and then yep. your parents said, uh, we should go on vacation and visit them. It turned yeah. out to be more than a vacation. It, it did. It, uh, it literally did start that way. Um, my grandparents wanted to retire in Hungary. Uh, after they worked, um, you know, until they were 65, 70 years old. And uh, my father, you know, he said, well, why don't we come and visit you for a couple of weeks? And then we'll come back home and we'll live happily together. And, you know, that was, uh, was um, short-lived, that dream. Because once we came to the United States, we realized that, you know, we could actually, we could stay. We could actually stay and have our life. What did they know. see that said life is possible here? What we saw, what my parents saw, I think, was that, that people before them have done it before. It was an, an impossible dream. It was, it was completely up to us if it was going to happen or not. Mm -hmm. So your, parent, your grandparents were in New Jersey. So is That's there a correct. Hungarian yeah. community there? There is. I, I, you know, I think there's a Hungarian community everywhere. <laughs> there's only 10 million Hungarians, but you'll find at least one anywhere well, you go. Back in, in Hungary, <laughs> only 10 million, but their, their descendants have dispersed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. So when you came here, um, you were 16 and your little sister was 12. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were the struggles that each of you faced or didn't face uh, during those first years? Um, I think pretty much everything was a struggle. Everything because uh, it, was, it wasn't just that we were young, but it was also the language barrier. You know, none of our family members spoke English. So every day there was a struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when, you know, being in school, even after several weeks of being in school, I still couldn't do the basic things. I, 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 I couldn't ask how to get from one building to the next building or even just to use the restroom. I mean, it was a, a different system, different school system. You know, if you had to use a restroom, you know, you ask and you leave. And well, when you don't know how to speak and how to ask, mm. you know, it's, uh, it becomes difficult. So even something as simple as that. Uh, my sister being younger, I think she had an easier time adapting. Mm -hmm. You know, she also had a personality of uh, being very bubbly and outgoing and friendly and uh, she had a much easier time. Those darn extroverts, they just go and fit in wherever they right, are. Right, right. <laughs> awesome. Um, I want to come back to, to life in the U.S. in, in mm -hmm. a little bit, but um, your life as a professional 
um, ballet dancer and then now as a, as a ballet master and, and instructor, um, was really very unintentional from the very beginning. Uh, can, you, can you share that story about how you started dance lessons at the age of 10? And it started with my sister being interested in dance. Um, she was much younger. At, at that time she was eight years old and my mother believed that she was too young to do it by herself so she, clearly she needed supervision, a babysitter, you know, and uh, little did I know that she literally meant to be with my sister, you know, at all times. So I had to take classes with her in the actual studios and um, that's, that's how my dance training actually began. It was making sure that my little sister was okay. So and your then, career got its start based off of a whim of your little sister. Exactly. Exactly. And 30 years later... <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope she's proud of you. <laughs> I think she is. I think she is. Yeah. And uh, just to, to complete the story, uh, your little sister, after a while, lost interest and, and dropped out she of She did. You know, she, she managed to dance a little bit. And, uh, but I think it was much more of a hobby for her. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, she, she stopped dancing. Um, you know, I'm not sure at what point for me it turned from being a hobby or something fun to do where I decided that this is something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, it moving to the U.S. certainly put a stop on it because I did stop for two years. When I was 16, I didn't dance at all, 16 through 18. And those are crucial years for a dancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, most dancers, that's where they start going into auditions. That's when they start getting trainee and, perfecting and apprentice their skills. Uh, yeah positions with companies, mm -hmm. you know. So for me, those two years were crucial, but, um, and you know, I often thought about it, why it was that I came back to dance. And I think it, it was that barrier, that language barrier of not being able to express myself mm -hmm. verbally. Uh, I always, you know, I started having these strong urges and feelings of, I, 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 I wanted to, there was something I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And the only way I could relate to it is through what I knew, which was through movement, through physical movement, through dance. Mm -hmm. So not being able to speak brought back all these emotions of, I have to do it through dance. I, I need some expression. There, there, there was my outlet, basically. Mm -hmm. There was no other way to, to do it. Yeah, yeah. And for, for people who aren't aware, to enter Ballet is uh, is a huge commitment. Can you talk it about is, the training absolutely. for yeah. for um, young people? You know, once you decide um, that this is what you want to do, uh, that's that's pretty much it. You know, especially in Europe. You know, so you mean, can't also schools, belong to the soccer team um, and the chess club no, and the. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I was ten years old and then I auditioned for the national school. And they said, all right, you're accepted. And, you know, just the audition process, you know, you're, you're in a room with hundreds of kids, hundreds. And they'll probably take about 20 boys and maybe about 40 girls out of four or five, 600 kids easily. Mm. So just being able to say that they have chosen me, that they see the potential that I could do this, that is huge. I mean, uh, your perspective, even as a young kid, it, it changes immediately. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you start understanding the culture behind it and, and, and the importance of it all, and, and then you you immediately try a little bit harder as well because mm -hmm. now you belong somewhere where you know only a selected few can get in. So, how many days a week do you practice? Seven. Well, you know, at that age, it was still six. Okay. You know, because we didn't perform quite as much. You mm -hmm. know, so uh, but absolutely on Saturdays, all the way through Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, usually the day started out with going into school, you know, getting rid of the academics right away in the first part of the day. And in the afternoon, you start with dance. And it would go anywhere from 5 till 8 or 8.30 at night, 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, and then after that, back to the dormitory. Um, go to sleep, wake up, make your bed, do it again. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the transition? Because you danced on the stage for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, into your early 40s, hung up your shoes and went to, you know, being an instructor. What is that transition like for you? It's, uh, for me, it was very interesting. I think for everybody, when you get to that point that uh, if you're lucky enough, that you are actually 
able to get to that point in your career where you're, you say that I'm going to retire now, that your career is not short-lived and stopped by an injury, which is so very common amongst mm -hmm. dancers and, and athletes as well. Absolutely. You know, once you decide to, to, to retire and you, you start thinking about your future, it becomes very personal. So everybody, you know, everybody does it on their own time. You know, um, and you sort of kind of figure out what it is you want to do. A lot of dancers move into a completely different field. Some become choreographers, some teachers, directors. But I think it's a personal choice for everybody. For me, teaching seemed an obvious choice because I like working with kids. Mm -hmm. um, and also teaching dance, the human body always fascinated me. Movement. Um, so teaching was an option. So the Grand Rapids Junior Ballet um, has how many kids in the educational program and then how many in the company itself? The school itself we have uh, approximately around 200 students enrolled but the junior company only involves about 40 to 45 dancers of the 200. It's, uh, the program was created for students that are interested in becoming dancers, professional dancers or are willing to commit their time to the productions that we're doing because we perform quite a bit more than the school alone. Mm -hmm. Generally the school has two main performances throughout the year. In the junior company we do about five, sometimes six productions on our own and then if their rep is appropriate then you know we'll be part of it such as the Nutcracker this year, the junior company and the school are also involved with the company and uh, later on this year we're going to be doing Swan Lake and it, it you know is the same thing that the company is dancing and the junior company is going to be part of it to a certain extent. Sure. We have to wrap up in a moment but I want to mm -hmm. uh, ask one last question. What brings you joy? A uh, lot of things. It, it's what brings me joy? Um, being able to notice things around me because I think when you're, when you're aware of your env environment and, and who's around you and what's going on around you, you can find yourself in it and you can find joy in that mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Awesome. And uh, in the last couple of years, you've been finding joy in small people running around your house. Yes. <laughs> running very fast <laughs> yeah. and a lot. <laughs> With some improvised dance moves maybe yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, good luck. Well, we'll look for uh, the names of your two children to maybe appear on future programs for the, the maybe. Grand Rapids Ballet. Anyway, Attila, it's been a joy having you here uh, on Feel Like You Belong. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming by. Thank you for having me. You bet. Pleasure. You bet. And for the folks back home, stay tuned because we'll be back in just a moment with some tips on American English, American culture, and a little American humor. Americans make a judgment about the person they meet based not only on his or her language and behavior, but also on such details as facial expressions and a perceived warmth. To ensure a first meeting with an American business person goes well, here are some basics to keep in mind. Language. Say, it's a pleasure to meet you, so-and-so. You will need to repeat this person's name three times during the first meeting if you want to remember the name. Please note, English speakers say meet only on the first meeting. On a following meeting, say, it's nice to see you again, not meet you again. Another option might be, it's really great to finally meet you, Susan. Ben here has told me so many good things about you. Informality. Americans tend to be less formal than many cultures and often call each other by first name. If you are a student, for example, meeting other students your age, this is appropriate. However, it's not a bad idea to show respect to an older person when you first meet him or her by using the person's title plus last name instead of first name only. Here you can take a cue from the person who is introducing you. Note the difference in these two sentences. Khalil, this is my old friend Bob. Your reply then would be, nice to meet you Bob. Khalil, 
This is my friend Bob Pesek. Dr. Pesek is the director of the XYZ Institute. Your polite reply then, it's nice to meet you, Dr. Pesek. Now, after a while in the conversation, Dr. Pesek may invite you to call me Bob, which then you are welcome to do. Note that Americans use a title such as Mr., Ms., Doctor, Captain, Pastor, only with a last name. Now, some cultures, for example, Arabic, use a title along with a first name, but this is inappropriate in English. So, for example, don't say Mr. Allen or Ms. Jacqueline. <laughs> Some of the best jokes happen between spouses. That's because the longer you're married to someone, the more you know their strengths and their weaknesses, which we then joke about. Here's one involving a husband and wife. Darling, how would you describe me? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. What does that mean? Adorable, brilliant, clever, delightful, elegant, fashionable, generous, and handsome. Ah, thank you. But what about IJK? I'm just kidding. 